Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to be breaking down the comic book called We Stand on Guard, written by Brian K. Vaughn, who also wrote Saga and Why the Last Man, two favorite series of mine which I've covered here on my channel, check those out. But I wanted to cover We Stand on Guard this weekend because I'm Canadian and this weekend is one of our big national holidays on July 1st, Canada Day. But also, in America, on July 4th, it is Independence Day. And in honor of these two holidays, I thought, what a good book to cover than one where Canada and America are going to war with one another. So that is the concept of this book, Canada and America at War. And I think it is a very interesting concept. As a Canadian, I've always wondered... What would happen if Canada and America went to war? How quickly would the Americans destroy us? <laughs> and that uh, question will be answered in this book. The artwork in this book is also beautiful. There are some really cool battle scenes in here, and they are illustrated oh so well. There is also plenty of Canadian references in this book, so uh, that is really cool as well. For instance, did you know the title, We Stand on Guard, is a lyric from our national anthem? So, so there you go, there's something you learned. Uh, there's also some interesting themes explored, such as climate change, as well as looking at American foreign policy. Uh, America went to war in Iraq to get their oil. Well, what will be the justification for the war with Canada in this book? Very interesting stuff. So let's dive into it. We Stand on Guard. We Stand on the Guard, written by Brian K. Vaughn, and art by Steve Scross. Issue 1 The year is 2112. CBC, the main government-run public TV broadcaster in Canada, sort of like the BBC in the UK, is reporting on the news that the White House in America has been attacked and is on fire. The country or terrorist group behind the attack is currently unknown. We are in Ottawa, Ontario, which is the capital of Canada. We see the Roos family. There is the father, Jim Roos, the mother, Alma Roos, and their two children, Amber Roos and Tommy Roos. They are all watching CBC News on television and the coverage of the White House attack. The father and mother discuss who might be behind such an attack? The Algerians, maybe? Or Cuba working with Greece? These are some of the possibilities that they are debating. Little Tommy asks, what if it was us? Alma, the mother, who's a lawyer that works for the government, tells her son, don't even joke about that. I could lose my security clearance if people heard you spouting that kind of nonsense. Tommy asks, but I'm serious. We burned down the White House before, right? By the way, that is a source of pride for some Canadians, at least. In the War of 1812, Canada burned down the White House. Although, if you want to get all technical about it, Canada wasn't even a country yet, so really it's more like the British burned down the White House, but Canadians like to take credit for it, because it's probably the only time in history where we kind of kicked the Americans' ass at something involving war, and that would really not happen again. Tommy's dad corrects his son and explains, That's just a myth, Tommy. Canada wasn't even a country back then. It was the British who torched Washington. Jim Roos, the father, he looks outside the window and he sees a Tim Hortons coffee shop in the distance. You know you're in Canada because of that. It is the most popular fast food chain in Canada. Anyway, as Jim Roos looks out the window at various buildings in Ottawa, in addition to the Tim Hortons, he says, Oh my god. As American missiles start falling from the sky and they start blowing up various buildings and killing many, the Americans seem to have retaliated on Canada for the White House attack, assuming that Canada was responsible for it. So Ottawa is being blown up, Parliament is getting destroyed, and the war between America and Canada has begun. Tommy and Amber's dad, Jim Roos, suffered severe burns and is missing a few limbs from all the bombing. Before he dies in the rubble, Jim tells Tommy, Tommy, you listen to me. 
You look after your baby sister. Whatever happens, you never leave her side. All right, now we're gonna have a little time jump now, but before I get to the time jump, I wanna give you a little context about our fictional future here. So in the year 2112, America has supposedly become a kind of dust bowl caused by poor regulation and climate change. And they are in need of water, fresh water they can drink. And apparently Canada has ample fresh water for the taking. So this is a potential motivation for why the Americans would want to go to war with Canada. Think of how America went to war with Iraq for oil. Well, in the future, water is almost as valuable as oil, and Canada has plenty of it. Now, did Canada actually bomb the White House in this story? Why would Canada do this, knowing the Americans could easily defeat them? Did America get their information wrong? Was it another country? Or maybe it was some sort of false flag operation the Americans did on themselves to justify going to war with Canada so they could take Canada's fresh water. That is what many Canadians in the story would come to believe in the preceding years, but no one really knows for sure. We jump ahead 12 years. The year is 2124. It is the 12th year of the war between America and Canada. We are in Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories in Canada. For those of you unfamiliar with your Canadian geography, here's a map of Canada. And here is where Yellowknife is. It is like way up there. Most people in Canada live in the south. Not that many live that far north. Amber Roos, the little girl we saw earlier, she is now an adult, 18 years old. She is walking in the snow in Yellowknife, holding a crossbow and wearing some sort of snow camouflage outfit looking pretty badass. Amber is tracking an animal to hunt it. She proceeds into the snowy forests. But there, she runs into some sort of American military robot made to walk on four legs resembling a dog. This robot is called a dog of war. The robot, speaking to Amber, tells her to stop. The robot says, You are not authorized to be here. Please produce your identity card. The robot also repeats this phrase in French, which is another official language in Canada in addition to English. Amber, she shoots at the robot with her crossbow. The dog of war robot retaliates and shoots back. A bullet grazes Amber's arm. The robot then pounces on Amber, and just as it is about to kill her, it explodes. Amber got saved in the last moment by a group of Canadian freedom fighters who shot down the robot. These Canadian freedom fighters are part of a group named 2-4. 2-4 is a common expression in Canada. It's what Canadians call a case of beer containing 24 bottles. 2-4-24, get it? Here it is used in a sentence. We went camping with the 2-4 of blue and got right ripped. Beauty! <laughs> that is a potential sentence you might hear a Canadian speak at some point. The members of 2-4 confronting Amber in the forests of Yellowknife are Victoria McFadden, their leader. Dunn, he is a tough looking guy with a scar on his face. He also has a pet coyote wolf. Hungry is the name of the pet coyote wolf, and it is referred to as a koi wolf. There is Oscar Booth, he is the team's medic. There is Leila Page, he is French and he was an actor slash comedian before the war started. He is supposedly pretty famous, even known to Americans and worldwide. There is also Kabani. She was an, an industrial engineer before the war. There is Highway. He is a geologist and he is also the group's explosion specialist. So this ragtag group of individuals makes up the Canadian Freedom Fighters group known as 2-4. Victoria McFadden, the leader, asks Amber, where the hell did you come from? Amber explains that she lives out here. She's been out here for the last year. Her brother Tommy got captured by the Americans on their way across Manitoba. Dunn, he doesn't believe Amber's story. He says, bullshit, you've been surviving out here all alone. If you're really one of us, a true Canadian, 
who took home the last Stanley Cup in 2111. Amber says, I got no idea. I was five and I don't even like hockey. By the way, we're about a hundred years in the future in this comic book, and I bet the Toronto Maple Leafs have still not won another Stanley Cup. The group, they buy Amber's excuse. They begin making their introductions to her, and they explain that they are the last of Canada's freedom fighters. Victoria, their leader, asks if Amber ever run into one of the Americans' dogs of war before? Amber says she has not. She didn't even think the Americans were interested in land this way up north. Victoria explains that the Americans never gave a damn about the land. This has only ever been about our water. Oscar Booth, the team medic, he checks out Amber's wound, while Cabani and Highway check out the destroyed dog of war. They theorize that there may be more around here. Victoria orders a sweep of the perimeter. Amber, as she is sitting there, she recognizes a member of their group, Layla Page. He was a famous actor. She tells him that she recognizes him, and LePage is happy to be recognized and have a fan. The medic, Oscar Booth, he rips some of his sleeve off to wrap it around Amber's wound. And by doing so, Oscar reveals a Superman tattoo he has on his arm. Oscar sees a puzzled reaction from Amber. He asks her, you got a problem with the Man of Steel? Amber kind of does have a problem with the Man of Steel as he's associated with America, she says. The guy who fights for truth, justice, and the American frickin' way? Oscar to this says, Ah, that's just some horse shit the company that stole the character shoehorned into his story. Really, Superman was made by one of us. Amber asks, I thought Superman was created in Portland or something. Oscar explains, Cleveland, but that was just where the writer was from. The guy who first drew Superman, who did all the real work, he was born and raised in Toronto, just like me. It's actually what the entire comic is about. See, Cabani listening to Oscar drone on says, Ugh, I can't listen to this nerd talk again. Oscar, though, he continues on unabated. He says, See, America is like Metropolis, this huge wonderland that's mostly run by greedy bastards like Lex Luthor. But we're like the planet Krypton, this peaceful place that sends our most amazing people out into the universe, where they usually end up doing even more amazing stuff. Totally makes sense, right? Superman's Canadian. As Oscar finishes nerding out on his love of Superman and taking credit for the character for the country, a massive American robot appears in the distance. This robot is the size of a tall building, kind of like a bigger version of the At-At Walkers in Star Wars. They call this giant robot a gorilla vehicle. The Freedom Fighters, they spring into action. They start firing missiles at this ginormous vehicle. They believe the vehicle to be unmanned, as the Americans rarely do any real fighting in person anymore. The Canadians, they drop some smoke bombs to hide their movement. The Freedom Fighters run beneath the vehicle, and they shoot grappling hooks up the giant robot and begin ascending it. Layla Page, he is ascending the robot and spraying some sort of substance that will eventually react with some explosives that will help take the robot down. As he is going up the leg and spraying it, Highway, the explosive expert in the group, he places a bomb near the foot of the robot. Highway arms the bomb, and then him and LePage retreat and run away. The bomb explodes and reacts with the substance that was sprayed all over the robot's leg, and eventually, the entire leg of the robot gets destroyed, and the massive vehicle falls down to the ground. Once the dust settles, the Freedom Fighters celebrate taking down this vehicle. Done, he gives the Koi Wolf Hungry a bone treat. The members of 2-4 walk over to the downed robotic vehicle to inspect the skull of the robot, where they believe the robotic AI is going to be. When they get there, though, the door to the brain area won't open, so they force their way in, shooting off the locks on the door. All the Freedom Fighters believed that this robot was going to be unmanned. So when they open the door, they are surprised to see an American soldier inside. The American soldier holding a small pistol, he shoots, and he hits Oscar Booth, the team's medic, 
right in the throat. Oscar falls down to the ground and dies. The members of 2-4 then begin to argue. Since when are these vehicles manned? They're supposed to be autonomous. Their sources must be wrong, or maybe the Americans have changed strategies. The American soldier gets disarmed. Cabani is going to shoot the American for killing their friend. But before she can fire, the leader, Victoria McFadden, says that Amber should shoot the soldier to prove herself. Victoria is suspicious of Amber. Maybe Amber is a spy or collaborator. Victoria says to the group, this girl just happens to show up right before our first enemy contact in weeks. She has to prove she isn't a spy. The group argue if this is the right thing to do. Highway, a member of the group, says that we've already got blood on our hands, so you know why make her hands get bloody as well? While they are distracted with their arguing, though, Amber, she doesn't hesitate at all. She grabs the gun and shoots the American soldier, killing him. We can see the cold look of hatred plastered on Amber's face. The Americans, they killed her mom, they killed her dad, they have captured her brother and made him a prisoner, and they have taken over most of her homeland. So if she has the opportunity to kill an American soldier, she will. Victoria and the group are satisfied and they welcome Amber to 2 4. Issue 2 We have a flashback to 2113, the second year of the war. Amber Roos was seven years old. Amber and her brother Tommy are in the province of Manitoba, living with their grandparents. One day, American soldiers kicked down their door and smashed their granddad in the face and arrested both the grandfather and grandmother. The Americans, they found a hunting rifle under their bed. The granddad, he argues, we are pacifists, we have nothing against you. It doesn't matter though, they are taken away as prisoners. Luckily, little Amber and Tommy did not get found as they were hiding in the dog's house on the property. But from that day forward, they were pretty much on their own. We jump back to 2124, continuing off of the events from last issue. Amber is 18 years old. Amber, she is brought to 2-4's massive army vehicle of their own. It is a tank that also looks building sized. They all get into the tank and begin driving to their hidden base. The group still doesn't fully trust Amber though, so they blindfold her so she won't know the exact location of where their base is. We jump over to an American military base in the territory of Nunavut. We see a tough looking military woman. We don't know her real name though. The Canadians, she has a reputation among them. She is known as the Grand Inquisitor or the American. The Americans though, they just refer to her as Ma'am. Ma'am is interrogating a prisoner named Mr. Pitulak. Mr. Pitulak demands a lawyer. Ma'am tells him, that's not how this works friend. You're an enemy combatant who got caught trying to sabotage a water supply that millions of innocent people depend on. The prisoner argues, I wasn't sabotaging anything. I was trying to provide for my family. Ma'am replies, so you admit that you're a thief, even though the US generously provides you folks with more than enough H2O. The prisoner says, to drink maybe, but what about my greenhouse? I used to be a farmer and you people have taken that away. Ma'am admits that her government doesn't care about these petty crimes. Mr. Pitulak had some blasting caps on him, similar to the ones used by the Canadian terrorist group known as 2-4 elsewhere in Canada. Ma'am wants to know the location of these 2-4 terrorists. She accuses Mr. Pitulak of supplying them. The prisoner denies everything. Ma'am, she plays hardball. She says that they will drag his wife and kid down here for questioning if he doesn't answer. Pitulak, he throws a glass of water at Ma'am, but the glass of water goes right through her. This reveals that Ma'am is not really there. She is just here in hologram form. She is just VR projected here, Ma'am tells the prisoner. 
Did you really think a bottom tier errand boy like you warranted a personal visit? Ma'am. She then gets pulled out of the interrogation to visit a colonel stores. The ma'am she leaves. She talks to the colonel. And the two of them discuss their giant robotic vehicle that went missing in Yellowknife. And how their scout he stopped responding to their calls. This is the vehicle that 2-4 took down. Ma'am says that she will task SEAL Team 60 to the area to investigate. The department is worried that this could be the birth of some sort of insurgency and they want to clamp down on it. 2-4 have arrived at their secret base. Their base is apparently in an old mine in a mountain. They remove Amber's blindfold. Their base seems pretty big and pretty well stacked. Reminds me of something you would see in Star Wars where the rebels would be hiding out in. The Canadians have also brought the ginormous American robotic vehicle they destroyed back to their base. They can maybe fix it up a bit and use it themselves. The group tells Amber that they have food for her and showers which she is free to use. Amber is most interested in taking a shower. While she is in the shower, she gets surprised by the Koi Wolf known as Hungry. In the shower, Koi Wolf is growling at her. Amber, she runs off. Dunn, who is sitting outside the shower, he inspects Amber's naked body. Amber is insulted by this. She calls Dunn a pervert. Dunn explains that he's actually gay. He doesn't need to sneak a peek on her for fun. He was just checking her out to see if she has any implant scars. And he doesn't mean breast implants, he means the government ones, as the Americans have been known to stick trackers in bodies. Dunn says that Amber looks all natural, though. She looks like she's in the clear. Dunn, he pets his coy wolf hungry and introduces him to Amber. Dunn explains that Hungry is a half-coyote, half-wolf. They started breeding after the weather messed up both of their old habitats. My husband and I found one roaming our property back in Nova Scotia. Amber asks about Dunn's husband. Dunn says his name was Paul and he lost him in the Battle of Brunswick. The two of them get interrupted by Cabani who says that their chief, Victoria, as well as LePage, have not reported back yet, and she is concerned. Outside in the snow, LePage and Victoria were surveying the area, and LePage notices a plane in the sky that doesn't look civilian. Over a communication device, he talks to Victoria and warns her to keep an eye out on soldiers parachuting in. It is already too late, though. Victoria tells LePage, Get out of here, LePage. Whatever you do, don't come back for me, I'm already dead. Victoria, she fires on some American soldiers with a shotgun of hers. One of these soldiers gets thrown back, but the other soldiers, they return fire on Victoria and take her down. And the soldier that Victoria shot, he's fine. His body armor took most of the blast. Victoria is still alive though. Her vitals are weak, but the soldiers, they load her up and they are going to take her with them for interrogation. Issue 3 We have another flashback to the year 2115, the fourth year of the war. Amber Roos would be nine years old. Her and her brother Tommy were in Manitoba, stowing away on a train. They ran into a hobo named Walchuk, and they discuss the war with him. Walchuk theorizes that the Americans are after the Canadians' water. Amber and her brother Tommy tell Walchuk that they are trying to get up north, trying to get away from the fighting. Walchuk he pulls out a map that shows the Americans have basically taken over all ten provinces so far. Walchuk tells them that they will have to go even further north than they expect in order to escape the Yanks. Walchuk says that he's going to go try and escape to Greenland and the children should come with him, but the kids end up doing their own thing and staying in Canada. Back in the present in 2124 in Yellowknife, Amber is 18 years old. The war is in its 12th year. Amber, Dunn, and Hungry are outside. 
looking for Victoria and LePage, who are scouting. Eventually, LePage returns to base, and he tells them that Victoria was taken. Elsewhere, we see Victoria is being tortured by Man for information. Man wants to know the location of the Resistance base. Victoria, she refuses to talk, and she is willing to be tortured. Ma'am explains that the torture Victoria will be subjected to is not what she might expect because they are not in the real world right now. Victoria is actually in a VR world, and Victoria's body in the real world will be safe and kept alive with medical professionals giving her the highest level of care. We see Victoria in the real world has all sorts of cables connected to her brain. In the VR world, Victoria will be tortured and everything will feel real to her, only it will all be in her head, and it won't ever stop, unless Ma'am wants it to, or if Victoria is willing to talk. Victoria in the VR world is lit on fire, and it feels so real to her, it feels like her face is melting off. Back in 2-4's base. The group is deciding what they should do next. Should they stay and fight? Or should they retreat now that their location might be compromised? I mean, what if Victoria talks? Some argue that Victoria is strong and she will never talk, but who knows what torture the Americans might be subjecting her to. Can they really take that chance? Back over to Victoria and her torturer. She feels like she's on fire, but Victoria is strong and she bears it. She will not give up her colleagues. Ma'am, a little frustrated, she has the computers reset the VR torture session and bring Victoria back to normal health. Ma'am, she tells Victoria she's going to do an experimental torture now. Clearly simulating physical pain is not working. Now, this next part is pretty dark, but I can see why it might be an effective torture tool. Ma'am has her technicians create a VR version of Victoria's dead father. Victoria's dad all of a sudden pops up in the VR world. Victoria's dad in VR tells his daughter, I'm here to help you, sweetheart. Victoria, she loves her dad and she starts freaking out. She says to Ma'am, Christ, please don't do this. Please don't ruin my dead father. Don't make him hurt me. Victoria's dad in VR says, Oh, I would never hurt you. I'm going to do what I always wanted to do and make love to you for the rest of... Victoria, oh, she's had enough. She immediately caves. She will not have her dearly beloved dead father molest her or something in this VR world. She couldn't bear ruining her memory of him. She tells Ma'am that the rest of her group are in a giant mine in Yellowknife. She asks Ma'am to please just turn this thing off. Ma'am doesn't believe her. She says, you're lying. That place caved in decades ago. Victoria explains just the upper levels. The rest is still accessible through an old cavern off of Ingram Trail. Please promise you won't kill them. Ma'am says that she'll do her best. And she tells Victoria... So sorry for what you had to see back there. I'll ask the medics to play you something peaceful. Ma'am orders the army to plan an attack on the rebels hidden base in the giant mine in Yellowknife. We see the Americans have giant hovering flying ships that are on their way to Yellowknife. These ships are something called super tankers or they're nicknamed hosers and they are coming to transport troops, but also suck up tons of fresh water. Issue 4 We have a flashback to 2121, the ninth year of the war. Amber Roos would be 15 years old at the time. Amber and her brother Tommy were hiding in a cabin in Manitoba. Outside the cabin, there was American soldiers with flamethrowers. The Americans were threatening them, telling them, You moose fuckers have 60 seconds to surrender. Tommy, the older brother, in an effort to save his sister, 
told Amber to go out through the secret passage below the wooden flooring in the cabin and escape, while he will stay back and surrender, buying her time. Amber didn't want Tommy to give himself up, but he insisted. Amber, she did as she was told and escaped, and Tommy gave himself over to the Americans, and he was taken prisoner and shipped off to some sort of prison camp somewhere. Back to the current day in 2124, the twelfth year of the war. 2-4 is getting ready to fight inside their mountain base, as they feel the Americans may be coming. Don, who is on the surface outside of the mountain, is with his koi wolf, Hungry, and he is watching an American White Hawk flying vehicle land outside. Inside the mountain, we see American troops being supported by aircraft and dogs of war pile into the mountain base, and they close in on 2-4. So while the fighting is happening, Mam is communicating virtually with a man in Vermont at an Air Force base. This man in Vermont is highly important in the government. We only know him by the name Mr. Secretary, and apparently Mr. Secretary works closely with the President of the United States. Mr. Secretary talks about the need for more water sources, and then he discusses an attack on a desalination plant in San Diego that was bombed and caught fire, making their need for new water even greater. He blames the terrorist group 2-4 up in Canada. Ma'am listening to this doesn't believe it's true, she says. Are you sure? I mean, these people are monsters, but I doubt they have the capability to strike that far into foreign soil. Mr. Secretary talks about riots happening everywhere in America, in Salt Lake City, in Phoenix, in Miami, all over water. He tells Ma'am, the American public needs to understand that our fight isn't with each other, it's with extremist elements to the north. If we don't pull together to crush them there, it's more apparent than ever that the Canadians are going to bring their war here. Ma'am kind of realizes that this is uh, political bullshit. She says, so that's the narrative the administration is going with? And what, you want me to make sure no one will be left alive to contradict it? Mr. Secretary replies, it isn't a narrative, it's the truth. But yes, the last thing we need is one of these insurgents lying to some UN inspector or worse, the press, about who and what they really are. Ma'am tells Mr. Secretary to tell POTUS that she has it under control, SEAL Team 60 is on it, and they have orders to take no prisoners. Mr. Secretary asks about Victoria McFadden, the Canadian female terrorist leader they have. Ma'am replies, Sir, uh, she's awaiting tribunal at a secure detainment center. Can't just uh, march in there and... Ma'am, she, she pauses, and then she realizes that Mr. Secretary here is implying that she should have Victoria killed and damned due process. Ma'am says, Right, I'll take care of it as soon as I'm finished here. Mr. Secretary bids Ma'am farewell and says, Thanks and good luck up there, your country needs you. Back up in Yellowknife. The battle is getting intense. Amber Highway and LePage are atop their big tank transport vehicle, and they are firing at the American troops and vehicles approaching them. They wonder where Cabani, the other member of their group, is. Cabani, she ran elsewhere. She's staying behind. She's going to try and drive the ginormous American guerrilla vehicle that they confiscated during their battle in Issue 1. The Canadians didn't have time to fix the leg or really figure out how to drive it properly, but hopefully Cabani can figure it out a little bit as she is going to do her best to use its weapons to try and take down some of the Americans coming at them. Amber, Highway, and LePage, they retreat. We see Cabani and the guerrilla vehicle blasting away at the American attackers as the mountain starts falling in around them. Amber and Highway and LePage, they retreat outside of the mountain in their large tank transport vehicle, and they are able to drive it right through the various rocks and mountain collapsing in around them, and they make it outside. As soon as they get outside, though, we see that 
SEAL Team 60 is there, and they have done, and the Koi Wolf Hungry tied up hostage. SEAL Team 60 yell at the members of 2-4, Exit the vehicle immediately, or we'll have no choice but to kill your comrade. Another SEAL Team member adds, And your little dog, too. <laughs> That's a Wizard of Oz reference if you didn't get it. A different SEAL Team member says, Jefferson, don't be a dick. The SEAL Team 60 members tell 2-4, Surrender now and I give you my word that none of you will be harmed. Inside the tank, Amber, Highway, and LePage are debating on what they should do. They don't want to have Don die as well, but they don't believe that they will really be unharmed if they surrender. Amber asks Highway, Can these cannons take out the Americans without hurting our guys? Highway says, No chance. It's over, Amber. The SEAL Team 60 members yell out, We're done negotiating, kids! What's it gonna be? Amber, filled with rage, yells, Open! FIRE! Issue 5. No more flashbacks, we are staying in the current day in 2124. We are in a prison camp on Prince Edward Island. That is the island on the east coast of Canada. Victoria McFadden was sent there to work the field with other prisoners. Because this is the future, the Americans don't even send in-person guards the whole thing is guarded by robots. Victoria McFadden, while she is working this field, she meets Tommy Roos, who is the brother of Amber that was taken away a few years ago. The two of them get to talking. Tommy has some sort of special glasses on that has a pirated CBC feed that he can watch and get some news. So despite being a prisoner here for a few years, he is well aware of who Victoria is and her group, and the news going on in the outside world. Eventually, Tommy asks if Victoria happened to meet his sister Amber. Victoria is hesitant to talk, though. After her torture sessions in VR, she is scared. She doesn't know if she's in the real world right now, or if she is in a VR world and the Americans are just messing with her to try to get more information. Tommy reassures her though, he says, You're smart to worry if this is another VR head trip of theirs, but I promise we're still trapped in what's left of the real world. Victoria asks, After what they did to me, how can I ever be sure? Tommy says in their simulations, Did you ever notice that nothing ever tasted quite right? You just can't fake that familiar flavor of blood in your mouth. So you sure as shit couldn't fake one of these. Tommy pulls out an Eat More chocolate bar and allows Victoria to taste it. When Victoria does, she now believes she is in the real world. The chocolate bar tasted too good. She tells Tommy that she did run into his sister, but she's sorry because thanks to her big mouth, the Americans have probably already captured her or worse. Tommy, he's not sad though. He tells her, Chief, if you sent the Americans after my sister, it's not her. I'd be concerned about. Back over to Amber. She is yelling for LePage and Highway to fire. They refuse though, as they will kill Dunn in the process. Well, luckily though, the debate does not go on for so long, as Cabani managed to survive, and she got the American's large gorilla vehicle working. And that vehicle apparently has some sort of precise laser weapon. She uses it and slices SEAL Team 60 members in half from a distance, killing them all. Cabani, when she returns to the rest of 2-4, she comments, I'll give the Americans this. Their military industrial complex makes some badass shit. Having a moment of safety now to talk, Amber LePage, Cabani, and Highway all discuss. They wonder why the Americans didn't just blow them all up with airstrikes when they found out their location. Why did they send in live soldiers that might die? Amber wonders, maybe they wanted some of them alive to, you know, interrogate. Dunn says no. They clearly got all the information they would have needed from Victoria. That is when the Canadians realize the Americans are sending in their super tankers or hosers to suck up all the water. And they couldn't risk airstrikes which might contaminate the water. Highway, he points to the ground and he says, 
I may have neglected to mention this when we moved in, but we're standing on top of enough arsenic to kill every man, woman, and child on either side of the border. If the Americans had carpet bombed this old mine, they would have risked poisoning the water supply they're obviously here to steal. Amber hearing this looks confident and says to the group, well, we just got our marching orders. Dunn, Highway, and Cabani are less confident, they ask. You want us to take on the entire American fleet? With one old truck and a robot that Cabani just learned to drive? This is pretty much the definition of a suicide mission. Amber replies, so is whatever we take on at this point. At least this has a chance to make a real impact. One of these SEAL Team 60 members that is lying on the ground, almost dead. He is wearing his fancy mask that has night vision goggles, but it also apparently has a video camera relaying back video to base. He speaks up and tells the two four members there, Awesome plan. Too bad the good guys just heard it. They'll be waiting for you shitheads. Amber walks over to him and says, That's alright. They won't have to wait long as she blasts that soldier in the face. Jumping back over to the Americans, we see Mam was watching this entire conversation as the video feed from the SEAL Team 60 members goggles was feeding everything back to them. Mam, she is getting a briefing by some of the American soldiers there. One soldier technician tells Mam that they've been running facial recognition on all the various 2-4 members here. And there's a strong possibility that one member is Amber Roos. If so, her mother would have been Elma Roos, a high-value legal advisor to the Canadian Armed Forces back in the day. After the White House attack, she and her known associates may have been targeted for the initial... Ma'am cuts the soldier off, and she says she recognizes one of them as Layla Page, and she's a little shocked as he's a famous actor. She says that he is enemy number one right now. The last thing that they want is a famous oddball that this country may actually want to root for. All of a sudden, the super tanker that Ma'am is flying in that is heading to Yellowknife to the members of 2-4, it gets hit by some fire. The members of 2-4 are doing their damnedest to fight back, firing missiles and rockets at it. Ma'am, she starts speaking to the other military people on board. Some of the people in the military there want to just launch missiles down at the Canadians below, but they can't do that as they don't want to risk poisoning the water supply. So instead, they decide to try and use their precise laser weapon technology to slice through 2-4 down below. The Americans fire their laser and it pierces 2-4's tank, and it slices right into Dunn's belly. While that fighting is going on, Highway and Amber stole SEAL Team 60's White Hawk aircraft that was down there, and it is apparently so well designed that even though none of them have any flight training, they are able to fly it. They fly it right up to one of the Americans flying super tankers, and they shoot and mow down tons of American soldiers. They then fly the White Hawk inside the super tanker. Amber and Highway get out of the White Hawk. Highway he borrowed their previous comrade, Oscar Booth's Superman shirt that has a little Canadian logo on it, and he says, let's do this. Seconds later, though, Highway gets a shotgun blast to his head. His head explodes right off his body, and he dies and falls down to the ground. Mam was the one that fired that shotgun blast. Mam, talking to Amber, tells her, that's enough, Amber. Amber is confused. How does this random woman she's never met know her name? Ma'am says, I don't really want to take another life today, kid. Please be smart about this. Just lace your fingers behind your head and get down on your knees. Amber instead, though, she opens her coat jacket and says, you know what? I'd rather not. And we see she is wearing a suicide bomb vest. Issue 6, The Conclusion. Dunn in the tank is dying, his guts falling out of his body. LePage is tending to Dunn. Dunn tells LePage to take care of his pet, Hungry, please. And then he passes away. 
LePage is crying over his dead friend. He says, God damn it, Dunn. I hate that smelly old animal. The Americans with their laser weapon from up above are continuing to fire it down below. They are slicing through that tank. It seems moments away from killing LePage and the pet Hungary. Cabani, though, in the gorilla vehicle, fires some missiles up into the air, which manage to temporarily stop the laser weapon's effectiveness for now. As long as she keeps the missiles firing, it should buy LePage some time. Cabani tells LePage that she's been tinkering with the gorilla vehicle, and she is finally able to get a signal up here at this elevation using its transmitter. And she can transmit a pirate feed that will allow LePage to speak to the people over the airways. LePage, he starts speaking over the signal. He is switching between English and French. He says, My name is Le LePage, and in the past I was an ordinary actor, but a very good humorist. But now I'm part of what we call the 2-4, a group of ordinary citizens like you who decided that they'd had enough. Despite the obstacles which we face, we are not stupid, my compatriots and me. We know we can't win this war, but what if we could just win one battle? Back over to Amber. Amber has her suicide vest on, and she explains that she has a dead man's switch on it, so if she gets shot and her hands leave the device's trigger, it will explode. Ma'am puts her shotgun down. No sense shooting Amber if she will die as well. Also, if Amber explodes, the super tanker will explode as well and crash down into the ground and contaminate the water. A whole bunch of American soldiers start making their way over to the room that Amber and Ma'am are in. They are all amped up to shoot Amber first and ask questions later. But Ma'am instead, she shuts the door before they can enter. She yells, idiots, fall back. The kid and I are trying to have a conversation. Ma'am and Amber talk. Ma'am figures that Amber has demands. Well, she asks, what are they? Amber says, just one. Tell your people that we want you out of here. Ma'am to this says, I wish it were that simple, but this fleet just can't turn around and leave the territories until... Amber fired up replies, I'm not talking about a single fleet. I want your entire goddamn military out of Canada right frickin' now. Ma'am pauses and says... I see. Ma'am, she's looking around the room and she sees the dead body of Highway lying on the ground nearby. And she sees the Superman shirt that he is wearing. Ma'am tells Amber, you and your friends know the Man of Steel is fake, right? In the real world, saving humanity involves everyone working together, not one messianic weirdo with brute force. Amber replies, saving humanity? That's what you call blowing up your own president in the White House so you could have an excuse to pillage your neighbors? Ma'am to this says, ah, the old false flag fantasy you Canadians seem to be obsessed with. Amber, do you want to see who is really to blame for that drone strike on the White House back in the day? Because I'd love to introduce you. Ma'am, she has a VR video start playing in the room. On the video is a man named General Ward. He was the last Canadian to serve as Chief of Defense Staff back in the day. This video is from his final interrogation shortly after the attack on American soil back in 2112. In the VR hologram recording, General Ward admits, Yes, all right. I gave the authorization and I do it again. Every intelligence source confirmed that a preemptive strike was our best and only hope of preventing the full-scale invasion your leaders had been planning since... Amber cuts off the recording and says, Bullshit! You people can make a prisoner say anything. So were the Canadians really going to do a preemptive attack on the US? Or were the Americans just somehow faking this interrogation video? Although maybe there was truth that the Canadians had intelligence that the Americans were going to attack Canada themselves, so they had to attack first. Either way though, Ma'am replies, The only bullshit here is this guy's assertion that the US ever had any intention of attacking Canada. I'm sorry Amber, but I can show you another hundred pieces of evidence to support the fact that your country chose this war. Amber argues, even if any of that crap were real, it doesn't justify the response. 
you people slaughtered innocent civilians. Ma'am cuts in and says, like your mom, what the hell makes you think she was innocent? Your mother worked for the armed forces, no? Amber says she was a lawyer. Ma'am continues, with security clearance that would have given her access to all the nasty plans being made at the highest levels of your hopelessly corrupt government. Amber tells Ma'am, I get what you're trying to do. Provoke me, force a mistake, but I'm not falling for your... All of a sudden... The super tanker they are in takes another huge blast, courtesy of Cabani, in the gorilla vehicle down on the ground, firing up above. The super tanker is a little unstable now and is rocking and swaying viciously. Ma'am, she takes this opportunity to try and tackle Amber in the commotion. She tries to wrestle the dead man's switch from Amber's hands. Ma'am tells Amber, you let go of that thing, you won't just be killing us. If this ship goes down close to that much arsenic down below, you will forever spoil one of North America's last reserves of clean water. Amber elbows Ma'am off of her. She asks Ma'am, Was anything you spat out back there true? Ma'am, bleeding from her lip, replies every word. Amber pauses and says, Maybe. You were definitely right about one thing. There was no Superman out there, because... You know what really happens when you blow up a kid's parents? You don't get some noble defender of justice. You get me. Amber, she releases the dead man's switch, blowing herself up, killing ma'am as well, blowing up the super tanker too. The super tanker now on fire crashes down into the ground in the lake below, creating a gloriously large explosion and by the super tanker crashing with the force it did, it would release the arsenic in the ground, which would seep into the water supply, which would poison the water supply, making the water useless. A US military general in a different super tanker watching it all go down, reports to Mr. Secretary, that mysterious man in Washington, and he tells him, Mr. Secretary, our lead tanker is down. Those savages poisoned the well. What do we do, sir? We see Mr. Secretary standing in a dried out cornfield in America that is dried out due to lack of water. Mr. Secretary is defeated. With the water now poisoned, there is no point in staying there up in Canada to try and get more. He orders the Americans to begin retreating. Cabani and LePage are watching the American super tankers retreat and fly away. Cabani asks, You think they'll be back? LePage answers, In time, for now. We should just appreciate the peace. Cabani says, nah, this ain't peace. It's victory. Over at that prison camp in Prince Edward Island, Tommy, watching the pirated CBC feed of the American tankers flying away, tells the rest of the prisoners there, the last of the hosers just disconnected. I think we won. The prisoners all jump for joy. Victoria, talking to Tommy, says, Look, we don't know who's still standing out there, but whatever happened to Amber, your sister's name will go down in history next to Fox, Douglas, and the Trudeaus. She's a goddamn hero. Now, if you ask me, it's not a real victory when you destroy the water supply that you're going to need as well, but I guess whatever, the Canadians won this battle and the Americans have retreated, and that is cause enough to celebrate we end our story in a flashback to 2110, two years before the war. Amber Roos is four years old. Amber is in Ottawa. She can't find her family on the street, and she begins crying. All of a sudden, though, Tommy and her parents find her. And Amber, she wipes away her tears and says, I thought I lost you guys forever. Amber's mom hugs her and tells her, There, there, sweetie. Mommy and Daddy were scared too, but everything's okay now. We're all all right. And the story ends on this image of a happier, peaceful time. And that is the end of We Stand on Guard. Alright, so that was We Stand on Guard. I'm a little mixed on this book, but overall I liked it. Let me go through some of my pros and cons. So first, the pros. I really loved the artwork in this book. Some of these battle scenes with the large mechs looked awesome. I think the concept of this book was a really neat one to explore. 
Canada and America at war with one another. How did it happen? Why did it happen? And how did the war progress? And how quickly did the Canadians fall? And how did they fight back? All that was pretty fun. I liked the Canadian references in this book, although I will say there were maybe a little bit too many. It almost felt like Brian K. Vaughn was going through some sort of checklist of Canadian references he wanted to make. Uh, I thought the future technology explored in this book was really cool. Seeing the giant mechs, seeing the VR hologram stuff, seeing the interrogation of Victoria McFadden and how they were going into her brain and inter interrogating her in there. That was all really cool stuff. I thought some of the themes explored in here were pretty good. Exploring the theme of war and American foreign policy. We see some parallels between the war in Iraq and how America went there for their oil and how America justified that war. And in this book, we kind of see that done to an absurd degree. How does America justify the war with Canada to get Canada's water? You know, Canada is a great ally of America and their neighbors. So how does America justify it? So I thought that was interesting. Now, some of the cons, I thought, were that the character development was really lacking. We were introduced to a whole bunch of characters and then they kind of get killed off and that's about it. Another thing that kind of bothers me is just the overall premise of America going to war with Canada for water. I never fully bought into the reasoning behind it. And I also did not like the ending of this book. How Canada basically poisons its own water supply so the Americans leave and that's somehow seen as a victory? I don't know, man. The uh, poisoned water is kind of bad for everybody. So don't love the ending, but overall I still had fun with this book and the concept and the uh, battle scenes. So I'm going to give this one a 7.5 out of 10. Thank you all for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And next week I will be back with more comics. Thank you.